Welcome to worship. Folks who are gathered here in our church home are finding a seat. Thanks be to the Lord God and the Lord Jesus who gather us in together. Welcome to worship as we celebrate the ministry and mission of lay people. This third Sunday in October for us as United Methodists is traditionally when we celebrate Laity Sunday. You as a congregation have celebrated that in a variety of ways over the years. Your leadership, the lay leadership folks and I thought this year it was my turn to be able to honor you and share with you. I'm really excited about what lies ahead for us as you share more about your passion as a person who follows Jesus. As together we discover your spiritual gifts, if you have yet to discover your spiritual gifts. As you share with others the natural talents and the skills that you have both been gifted, given by God, but also developed in a variety of settings. And so I'm still getting to know who you are, brothers and sisters in Christ of Epworth United Methodist Church. That word laity, lay, it simply means people. It comes from the Greek word that means people. So as we celebrate Laity Sunday, we celebrate the whole people of God, all of you gathered online, all of you gathered in person. Uh, before we move along in worship together, we have sharing from one of our lay folks. I thank you, Linda, for sharing with us at this point. I think Linda's among us, and if it takes her a moment to reach the microphone, then let me share a bit about our life together for a little bit. Here is Linda. Welcome, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Well, I get to do this my turn this week, and I'm so proud to do this. We would like to welcome and thank Karen for coming here to be our pastor. Many, 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 many years ago. Dad, it wasn't that long ago. Just a couple years ago. Little Karen McRae was in my English class. And I watched her grow up in this church. And of course, coming back here was fairly comfortable for her. And she knew a few of the people here, us old timers. But I especially feel that it must be hard to come to a new church and not meet people in person that you don't know. So we appreciate your effort to get connected in other ways. We appreciate your faith, your optimism, your energy. Little Karen McRae, <laughs> look at you now. <laughs> many, many years ago, yes. Uh, thank you for being here. You are a blessing. Thank you. I thank you so much. Uh, you folks continue to shower appreciation on me. Last week you shared with me and uh, I shared some of those goodies that you gave me as a gift last week. I think I'm just going to hold on to the flowers all for myself and thank you. I realize on the altar there's this prime place that's not too close to a flame and yet does not cover the cross. So my thanks to our worship committee who always find the right place. Well done, well done, worship committee. If you see any of those catch on fire, you know what to do, folks. You know what to do. Before we receive the music, I offer some uh, words that go along with the music. And I offer these by way of prayer. Laity Sunday is a great Sunday for us to be reminded and celebrating that it is 
the love of Jesus that binds us together. That's the tie that binds us together. And so before Eric and Clara share, I offer the words of bless be the tie that binds. Please be in prayer with me. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share each other's woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Amen. I think we're starting to develop a fruit salad. All right. Are you guys awake this morning? Ooh, I think they're awake. Awesome. All right. Good morning, Mission Kids. That works. Good morning, Epworth family. Good morning, Epi. She said good morning to me. And Pastor Karen. Hi, Epi. Hi, everyone. I hope you had a good week. Do you have your Fruit of the Spirit items from your bag this week? Did you notice that this week was a pear? Hmm. Ooh. It's for patience. Hmm. I wonder if Noah liked apples. Hmm. Then I realized he preferred pears. Have you ever wondered how much patience Noah had to have with two of every animal in the ark? I'm sure it was lots of patience. 
Ephesians 4, 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Last week, we talked about peace. The week before that was joy and love started our journey. Patience is this week. Fruit of the Spirit, and we always want that for our Epworth family. Pastor Karen will be talking about patience in her sermon today. Our Epworth family works together, and we need to have patience because we can't always have the things we want right now. We had to have patience when the elevator was being fixed and when the boilers were being installed. We can practice patience in our daily activities. The Holy Spirit is here helping us develop the gentle, loving characteristics of God's patience. How can you be patient with others this week? Hmm, should we think about that? Especially with all those online classes and some of us being in school and some of us being at home, and still having a community that's in a classroom? Wow, lots of patience. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all the times. For all the times. You have helped us to be patient. You have helped us to be patient. It is hard to be patient. It is hard to be patient. We usually want things right now. Like Noah, like Noah, wanting the rain to stop. Wanting the rain to stop. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the reminder that you are patient with us. That you are patient with us. Please help us all. Please help us all. This week. This week. To be patient. To be patient. Like you are. With all of us. With all of us. Amen. And I'm sharing with us today about the items in our life together, the events and the activities. As usual, tomorrow, Monday, is the time when various committees meet and then also church council meets. So our worship committee meets and our trustees committee meets. They both meet at 6 o'clock tomorrow here at the church. And then at 7 o'clock is church council. And I remind you that all three of those are open meetings. There are a handful, maybe three groups in our congregation who actually meet in a confidential way. But all of those are open meetings, and you're always welcome to join with those. The other item, you may already have talked to our mission chair, Laverne, about whether you have a role in preparing something or helping to feed the flathead this Thursday. It's our turn to be a part of the community kitchen feeding the flathead on Thursday. And I know Laverne has enough servers. Uh, feel free to check with her if she's still looking for brownies. The last item is we're grateful for the youth and their families and the leaders who are experimenting with what youth group looks like. And so next Sunday, again, fourth graders through high school seniors will meet downstairs in Danny Mark Hall. They'll be doing some of the preparation to help for the celebration that will happen on All Saints Eve on Halloween on the 31st. That's a Saturday. So uh, you'll notice on the back of the insert uh, is a reminder about the activity on the 31st. That's where we're sharing with the children, youth of families who are connected to our church family. And we will have bags to go on Saturday the 31st for the spooktacular from 1030 in the morning till 1230 in the afternoon. Then we're moving into a time of prayer. One prayer that our folks who are part of the ministry of the Red Cross share with us. We have folks among us who are 
servants. They serve the Lord Jesus in a variety of ways, just as the rest of you do. And one of their ministries is the Red Cross. So they offer prayers for several families in Cutbank who were affected by an apartment fire. In particular, we're praying for one person who had some very severe burns, others who've lost everything that made a home for them, maybe others who have um, some other injuries that might not be quite as severe. We also have folks among us, your brothers and sisters in Christ, who say, thank you for your faithful prayers. Like you, they believe in the power of prayer and this ministry that we have that also helps bind us together. With our first real snow of the season, with feeding the flathead, those folks who don't have a place to live in right now in Cutbank, we have that renewed sense of how much people need a warm place to sleep at night, how much they need clean, fresh water to drink and good, nutritious food to eat, how much people need at least one other human being who cares, how much they need to be able to receive care for whatever is an affliction or an ailment for them, be it of body, heart, soul, or mind. And so we move into a brief space of silent prayer where you have on your heart whatever concerns are calling to you this day. You may picture in your head people who you already have been praying for, situations where you continue to say, Lord God, we know you're already doing your will. How may I be a part? How may I be a part of doing your will? So just a bit of silent prayer. Lord Jesus, you remind us clearly that whatever we have done to care for another human being, we have done for you. That's not only a place of gratitude and thanksgiving for us, it's also a place of motivation, of incentive. Sometimes that doing is simply being. We trust in you to continue to shape us, Holy Spirit, so that we become, so that we be the people you dream we can be, the people you have created us to be, gracious God. As winter returns, not just to the Flathead, but to all of Montana and the surrounding area, give us that special sense of how we can create home for people who are without homes, Give food to people who don't have food. Uh, partner with, join with people who can tell us what they need and how they need our support. We're grateful, Jesus, for invitations to get to know our neighbors, or if we already at least can say hi, then to get to know each other better. We thank you for your healing power, your healing power through each one of us, your healing power through all faith communities, your healing power throughout the world, throughout the human community and all of creation. We pray in your name, Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Joining together in a prayer of confession, it's a very short prayer of confession direct from our United Methodist hymnal. I'm actually going to pronounce that multi-syllable word, magnanimity. Magnanimity is a word that I, I think if we looked quickly online, other, other of you may have looked at the graphs where you can see how frequently a word is used. My guess is, at least in the U.S., we don't speak this word much. We probably speak other words, which mean something similar to magnanimity, generosity, giving, love, mercy, care, compassion. Let's pray. Help each of us, gracious God, 
to live in such magnanimity and restraint that the head of the church may never have cause to say to any one of us, this is my body broken by you. Amen. In silent reflection as we have a little bit of music to uphold us. Oh, and Eric, that's probably our special music, isn't it? Then let me just finish out this piece, okay? Sorry about that. Let me just finish out this piece. So, congregation, we are at the place where after a prayer of confession, we always speak to each other those words of assurance. So I speak words of assurance, and you who have the bulletin in front of you will see you have the response. Your response, as soon as I finish, is in the name of Jesus. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And we finish with the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you both, Clara and Eric. We appreciate you very, very much. Uh, we'll be sharing scripture. I'm going to give just a reminder of where Paul has been in his letter with the Romans. So Paul, in the first part of his letter, is sharing his view of God's saving love with the Christians in Rome. And this is one place that Paul has not been physically present yet. The letters that we have in the New Testament, they're usually letters that Paul wrote to folks after he had been in that town, village, city, and actually shared with them about the good news of God's love for them through Christ Jesus. Yet he hasn't been to Rome yet. And while this is not a systematic theology where Paul gives a reasoned argument point by point, he certainly is giving some explanation. He's saying, God's saving love for you through Christ Jesus is evident in Christ's crucifixion, that cross, and then his resurrection. Paul asserts that every person is a sinner, and so every person falls short of the glory of God. Left to our own devices, we people will never become who God dreams we can be. And Paul then explains that the Lord Jesus bridges the gap kind of closes that space, whether you view it as from above to below or maybe separated by distance horizontally. Jesus brings us back together with God, the one who created us, repairs our relationship with God, and that's a pure gift. That's grace, something that we humans can never earn. And just to tie in, last week we had that Brief reminder about our Wesleyan way of understanding Christ's saving love, the scripture way of salvation. Paul will speak here about Christ's justifying grace. So grace flowing in a way that brings us into right relationship with God. We are in the fifth chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. And then hear this progression, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, and you can substitute there, hostile, separated at odds with God, separated from God. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
God proves his love for us. Focusing on that, God proves his love for us. Those were the words of assurance that I spoke and you responded to today. They are the same words of assurance that we hear when we share in that full liturgy of Holy Communion. So the full spoken worship for the Lord's Supper, we hear those words. And you see that those words, if you didn't know before, you do now, that they come right out of verse 8 of chapter 5 of Paul's letter to the people in Rome. God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all people. Christ died for all humanity. When we say Christ died for us, Christ died for our sake. Christ died for our benefit. That was a positive thing that Jesus did for us. God and Jesus did not wait for the time when we people were no longer sinners because the paradox there, the truth there, is that if they were waiting until we were no longer sinners for God and Jesus to take the initiative, to take some action, they would still be waiting. We, United Methodists, are right there with Orthodox Christianity and knowing that there's something about us people where we tend to live for ourselves. I sometimes refer to it as the soul sickness of sin. That's a model that comes from our Wesleyan way. Also in our Wesleyan way, sin's understood as that separation, that gap, that division we have with the holy and we have with other people. We sometimes refer to sin as a brokenness, something inherent in our nature where there are cracks, there are flaws, and that relates well to this dwell. 12 Steps Communities, um, character defects, something about us where there are character defects. Whatever way you understand sin, e even that reality of evil, there's a distinction between evil and sin, and yet oftentimes we will understand sin as evil intentions, maybe something in my heart prompted by envy, where I am outraged, but usually underneath my anger, there's usually fear. And there's usually hurt. And so sometimes that emotion shapes an attitude that is harmful. And that harmful attitude's revealed in what I say and how I say it, and what I do or I refrain from doing. So however you understand sin, Paul is saying that thanks be to God for God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus does for us what we could never do for ourselves. He saves us. He saves us from ourselves. And then Paul says, especially you note in verses 9 and 10, not just that he has saved us, but he is saving us. We will be saved. There's a progression there. So Paul has that sense of an ongoing action, a process still at work. God's prevenient grace that comes before we know how much God loves us and maybe you're really... Um, putting energy into an authentic relationship with God, God's justifying grace through Christ's crucifixion, and God's raising him from the dead that brings us into that relationship with God and opens the door to a relationship with Jesus. And then God's sanctifying grace, that's that holiness of love growing in us. So Paul understands a progression, and we who are United Methodists fall within that understanding because our predecessors, our forebears in the faith, have helped us to see, even though, even though um, we have a relationship with Jesus, we know the Holy Spirit continues to grow in us. So it's very Wesleyan for us to say we are being saved. And as the leaders in our education ministry with younger children help us celebrate the fruit of the Spirit in these weeks, they're helping us to see that sanctifying grace at work, that the fruit of the Spirit as they ripen and mature, that is the Holy Spirit growing in us, and love is always primary. Love is always that first fruit, just as it is that gift that is a more excellent way of being. So there's a sense of salvation yet to be realized in the future, even though we can rest assured that we have a relationship with Jesus, and so his saving love shines from us here and now on earth, and he will raise us up after we die, 
to that life everlasting, that resurrected life through him. And still, even in the midst of that, we can continue to mature in his love. I'm bringing us back to the progression that Paul listed for us in verses 3 through 5. And it's a progression of spiritual formation, regardless of our age, how we know we continue to grow in the love of Jesus, which then nurtures these other fruit of the Spirit. That progression of uh, boasting in our sufferings for Paul and, of course, for Christ Jesus that is not a one-upping where we try to outdo each other in listing our miseries that have come because we have followed Jesus. Instead, it's actually a paradox that when we suffer for the sake of the gospel, when we suffer because we are participating with the Lord Jesus in creating God's kingdom here on earth, then the glory of God shines through us for everyone to see not to see in a look at me, aren't I great <laughs> kind of way, but for everyone to see so that each one of us is an individual and that we decrease and the love of Jesus increases. Even to talk about sufferings in the midst of a pandemic is to acknowledge a reality that all of us have been suffering in different ways. Certainly people all over the world have been suffering in different ways through the pandemic. And you may be grieving the loss of people you love who have died because of COVID-19. You may be someone who's put yourself right in harm's way because you truly are deemed essential in however you serve, whether as a volunteer or what your job is that you get paid for or your vocation you draw a salary for. So we know suffering takes on a whole new understanding when there is a, a worldwide infectious disease. And still, when we suffer for Christ's sake, we might be tempted to make comparisons between Paul's suffering and us, or even the Lord's suffering, Christ's suffering himself when he was incarnate on this earth. So I'll name some of the ways they suffered that I have not, and still offer up the possibility for our, if not suffering, at least our giving up some desires, some conveniences, some comforts for the sake of the gospel. So we know that both Paul and Jesus were betrayed and denied. They were ridiculed and rejected. They were beaten and imprisoned. They were unjustly tried and unfairly sentenced to death, and they were tortured and executed. I haven't had any of those sufferings as a follower of Jesus, part of creating God's kingdom on earth. And yet I do believe that for us who follow Jesus, every day he calls us to sacrifice at the very least, he calls each one of us to give up our own individual will for the good of the body of Christ, for the good of the community we live in or we work in or we're connected to, uh, for us here in the Flathead, for the good of the whole Flathead Valley. And so, my brothers and my sisters in Christ of Epworth United Methodist Church, we can boast in some of the smaller sacrifices some of what we have released because we value being a part of Christian community and we value bringing the love of God through Christ to our wider community, to our valley where we live. And even as we boast in smaller sacrifices, we're not boasting in ourselves. We are boasting in a way that is praise. It's praising the Holy Trinity praising the Holy Spirit who gives us spiritual growth. I believe that every day the Holy Spirit grows in us, at least these two spirit, uh, fruit of the Spirit that were named in our prayer, at least two fruit of the Spirit were named in our prayer, that magnanimity. I think it takes on both the fruit that is love, but also the fruit that is generosity, um, has both senses, takes on both of those meanings. And then the prayer used the word restraint, I think restraint is related to this fruit that is patience, persistence, endurance. 
And it's also related to self-control, a fruit we'll hear about a little later, a little later um, in the month or next month from the young people. So self-control is about some discipline, some forbearance, some willingness to step back. Of course, I'm the one who gets most of the air time on a Sunday morning, and so when I'm in other conversations with you and with folks in the community, it's important that I do more listening than I do speaking. That's, that's part of patience. That's part of forbearance and restraint. You might think of other ways that you have... 13th chapter of First Corinthians, that you haven't insisted on your own way, but instead that you have trusted in the Holy Spirit through your sisters and brothers in Christ that the way of love would be made clear to you as Christ's body, oftentimes just step by step, day by day, sometimes hour by hour. Have a story to share. It's a story that comes out of the oral tradition, and it's a story about how God, the gardener, grows the fruit of the Spirit, actually cultivates spiritual dispositions. So a disposition, that's an attitude. It, it's an orientation. It's a leaning. And so I think this story also shows how we can participate with God, the gardener, um, by our own attitude, by, by how receptive, how open we are to these fruit ripening. One day a king set out on horseback with his hunting party to enjoy some sport. And because he was king, he did not need to hunt to feed his family or feed the royal court. He had all kinds of livestock that at any point in time they had for any meal of the day. When this king went hunting, it was for fun, for sport, for a personal challenge. In the heat of the chase, the king and his hunting party were separated. So the king was riding on and on, trying to catch back up with his entourage, with the rest of the hunting party. And as he rode through a forest clearing, he was intrigued but also relieved to find a garden. He found a garden there. The king was hot and thirsty, and as of yet, his horse and he had not crossed any streams or rivers or found any ponds or lakes so they had no water to drink. He thought the garden was a good sign. Obviously, there has to be some water near here for this garden to grow. Surely, he thought, I will find refreshment here. The king was dressed in hunting clothes like regular folks and didn't have any insignia attached to his horse that showed that he was king. And he approached a gardener, looking just like a regular old hunter. He saw a gardener and approached the gardener. And he said to the gardener, I am so thirsty. May I please have a drink? Well, the gardener said yes. And the gardener walked away from the center of the garden out beyond into an orchard where there were pomegranate trees growing. The gardener picked some ripe pomegranates and then he went into a small hut nearby, just this small shack, to squeeze the seeds into fresh pomegranate juice. As the gardener was away, the king's heart was filled with gratitude, connected to generosity, and the king's heart was filled with patience. He had some self-control. He'd waited a long time for something to slake his thirst, and now he knew, slake his thirst, and now he knew that was in process, so he was waiting. And yet the gardener came back soon, in just a few minutes. The gardener came back with a cup full of fresh pomegranate juice, and he gave the cup to the king, although he didn't appear to recognize the king. He didn't address him as your highness or O king or anything like that. The king immediately drank down that whole cup of sweet, refreshing pomegranate juice. And so the king was less in need than he had been, but he was still thirsty. And with at least that basic need met, he thrust the empty cup back into the hands of the gardener without a word of thanks. And instead of asking, the king demanded, bring me more. Where just a few minutes ago, the king's heart had been filled with 
magnanimity, generosity, gratitude, love, and filled with patience, restraint, forbearance. And now this heart was returning to what was more often the usual attitude of the king. His heart was filled with self. Self-absorption, self-focus, self-promotion. And already growing in the king's heart were struggles and challenges that he faced daily. Resentment and envy that there could be this wonderful garden here. He didn't even know it existed. How could it be that he was king of all the land and he wasn't even aware of this garden? Hadn't yet had any connection to it. As well as the challenges and the struggles of arrogance and greed. More, more, more. Give me more. And yet he never said, I am the king. He thrust the empty cup into the gardener's hand. The gardener took the empty cup. He walked back out to the orchard. And again, the gardener picked some ripe pomegranates. Then he went into the small hut again to squeeze the seeds into refreshing pomegranate juice. While the gardener was gone, the king walked around the garden, becoming a little more irritated and resentful all the while. He noted how abundant the vegetation was, and he saw the ripening fruit ready to harvest. And not just pomegranate, but pears. And you know the other fruit we've already had. Pears, strawberries, bananas, and orange. There you go. All this fruit ready to harvest. And the king thought, how much wealth would be added to my treasury if I were to impose a heavy tax on the harvest? Better yet, why not simply take the garden as my own? After all, I am king, and I have the power to claim whatever I want as my royal land holdings. The gardener did not return quickly, not soon, not in a few minutes, as he had the first time. The king waited and waited, becoming increasingly impatient and irritated. He thought to himself again, how is it the gardener could fill that first cup of juice so quickly? And now, after an hour, he still has not returned? The king was accustomed to being served by others, not to serving others. He was used to ordering other people to meet his needs not to meeting his own needs. And so he waited and waited. Finally, after more than that hour, the gardener came walking back to the king and he gave him the cup of juice. The king took the cup, looked inside it, and he was able to tip it without it overflowing. So the king saw the cup was not nearly as full as it had been before. He drank down the pomegranate juice and he thought it did not taste as sweet. It was not as refreshing as before. So the king made a sour face and even behind a mask, you're welcome to make a sour face. <laughs> the king made a sour face at the gardener and then he demanded an explanation for the poor quality and the meager quantity of the pomegranate juice. The gardener answered, you, O king, had a heart full of gratitude and a heart full of patience when you first asked for refreshment. However, as soon as that first need was met, your heart quickly changed, not for the better, but for the worse. I know of no other explanation for the sudden lack of the pomegranate's juice. A traditional tale in the oral tradition. A tale that's all about ripening fruit of the spirit and healthy spiritual growth and the maturity of faith that comes as we continue to grow. I believe that the Lord God gives us great potential for all of those. 
you who are a part of Epworth right now, you know that you already have magnanimity, the love of Jesus in you, because you are connected to the body of Christ. You also know that you have patience in you, because it's not easy to be connected to any human being, whether that's the folks we live with in our own household, our, our family of origin, the families we create as adults, folks we work with, neighbors. We know what it's like to live with character defects and to be living with others' character defects. So those two fruit, the fruit of love and generosity, they're connected, and then that fruit of patience, connected to the fruit of self-control. You already have those. You may be able to identify all the fruit of the Spirit that you have right now as a church family. I can share, just as Linda said, I was here in the 90s as a young adult. I was here in the 60s and the 70s as a child and a youth. I can say some of the fruit of the Spirit that I experienced with that Fourth United Methodist Church then. Some of those may be the same as now. They may be different. You, too, have a story to share about your connection with Epworth. You can give examples of how the Holy Spirit is growing, ripening, maturing the fruit of the Spirit among you. And you have stories to share with each other. Yeah, some of the stories might be 50 years old. <laughs> like, I'll share some of those along the way. Others of the stories are recent, 50 days old or 50 hours old. You all have encouragement to share with each other and that same encouragement, those same stories to share with the community beyond us. Um, doesn't take long <laughs> in oh, whether it's surfing a favorite site or a site you would never go to, listening to news you would never touch with a 10-foot pole or news you immerse yourself in having a conversation with someone that you know will try your patience where you need love to grow, or having a conversation with someone where it's really easy for you both to be loving and patient. It doesn't take too long for us to see how also beyond the body of Christ, the community of humanity the world over needs patience, needs compassion. Brings us back to our prayer of confession, and then I'll close. Um, I'll, I'll close with the the words of "They'll know we are Christians." Our prayer, of, our prayer of confession, makes reference to Paul's um, statement in a couple other letters. In a couple other letters, Paul writes, and you can find them in the New Testament. He identifies the Lord Jesus as the head of the church. The Lord Jesus is the head of the church, not the pastor. Not even the pastor who was a little girl here. Not the pastor. I'm not the person who chairs committee A, B, C, whatever committee we name. Or not the person who, like me, can say, my family goes back two generations in this congregation. And some of you can say three, and you can say four. Uh, with great respect to folks who've been following Jesus longer than I have, not even the longest living member of Epworth, the longest living connected participant with Epworth United Methodist Church as the head. We know it's Jesus. And so on Laity Sunday, it is a great reminder for us that every single one of us, including your appointed pastor, has sinned, is a sinner, has fallen, <laughs> does fall short of the glory of God. And that's, that's God's plan, <laughs> is that we be serving the Lord Jesus together uh, so that his magnanimity and his restraint can grow, can ripen in us, and we can share them with the world. I'm going to move to just two verses in the refrain of they'll know we are Christians, and then Claire and Eric will share that. Some of you know it by heart. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. 
Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. We'll remain seated. Thanks be to you, Christ Jesus, for your love for us and your love through us. We are grateful. You've given us challenges as well as joys. You say to each one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray in your name, dear Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. And we end our time together with the grace of God, our creator, with the love and the hope of Jesus, our savior, with the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit, our strength. Amen.
Thank you both so much. Thank you. We go with the peace of Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. 